Welcome from Las Vegas, Nevada, the host city of NAB 2014. We're here on the 45th floor of the Trump International Hotel. This is Cinema 5D on the couch. Presented by b &H, the professional's source. Vitech Videocom, Tools on Air, and Zeiss. Welcome to another episode of Cinema 5D on the Couch, today with our sponsor Tools on Air and Neil Anderson, their international sales manager. Hi. Hi Neil. So let's talk about your systems. I mean, I'm from production world. I'm not really you know, involved a lot in post-production. I do editing, I do that kind of stuff, um, some color correction, but um, all this live edit is, is quite new to me. We use your system here so to make our lives easier so yep. we can you know, edit while we're recording, um, but it's a completely new field for me. What do you guys do and what are the products you work on and um, yeah. Okay, uh, well Tools and Air is uh, a Mac software developer, so we have a variety of ingest and play out products um, that we've developed and I guess we fit either side of the post-production workflow. So we have some ingest products um, which you guys use, which is the live cut system and we have some play out products for TV channel play out. Uh, live play out of video and graphics. So on the ingest side of things we have an application called Just In, which is a multi-camera recording application. Um, what's great about that is we can record into things like QuickTime, uh, ProRes, MXF, um, and we can frame accurately record different camera ISOs. Um, but as soon as we start recording we can edit straight away. So we can really speed up the post-production process from, from the on-set, uh, on-location uh, scenario. Uh, once we've got the material in, obviously we can use Final Cut, we can use Premiere Pro, we can use Avid, um, but what enhances the ingest process, I guess, is Live Cut, which is our EDL recording product. So what we're doing there is we're recording the, typically the GPI output from a vision mixer um, and recording those tally lights as, a, as an EDL. And we can hand that off to the editor as we're recording the event. So it really speeds up things. So if you're working in episodic TV, soaps, sports, music festivals, corporate events, anything where you've got a, a you know, big multicam job and you want to get it finished and edited as quickly as possible. Um, so that's pretty cool. What we can also do is add some additional metadata as well. So we can have like a, a producer or a studio manager actually adding metadata as markers into the edit on, from an iPad, for example. So again, you can mark good take, bad take, you know, he swore, he got sent off, you know, those kinds of uh, little useful tools that the editors, you know, they've got the metadata and the timeline and they can see exactly where um, any fixes need to be made. So yeah, what LiveCut does is it records our ISOs and the multicam edits. So the editor really just has to open the file, the project file, and everything's there. The ISOs are there, all the cuts are in the timeline, um, and they can make the changes really quickly with the multicam tools or the trim tools and things like that. So from a production point of view, it's just, you know, a huge workflow time saver, I guess, so that the editor doesn't have to build the multicam clip themselves. You know, typically, I guess you guys are recording a program output as well. You've got all the cuts in there, but you've got to find where the cuts are. Do you use that as a reference or do you throw it away and just go with the ISOs? So it just makes that whole process a lot easier. Cool. And it doesn't matter which editing software you use. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have to be pretty flexible in this day and age. Um, we came from, I guess, the Final Cut 7 um, world. Um, but we have great support for Final Cut 10, which you guys use, um, as well as Premiere Pro uh, and Avid as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the stuff we do, so the Just In application, which, which does our sort of core recording, um, we actually have a panel for Premiere Pro. So for editors who just want to capture multiple cameras straight inside their NLE, and um, that's, that's quite a useful little piece of functionality as well. Cool. So what is Tools on Air? You're a Vienna-based company, so where yeah. you're based where we are from. Yeah. We got in touch with you guys because, you know, I had the stupid idea to, not stupid, but the spontaneous idea to make this show like one and a half months before NAB. We right. was just like a little bit late, but yeah, we tried to manage to get in touch with you guys and you were um, generous enough to, you know, give us a chance to use your software on this um, and uh, it worked quite well. Um, where, you know, Tell us a little bit about the company. Sure, yeah. I mean, we Tools and Air came to market around about 2008. Um, and so historically, the company is, is actually, the people who work there today have come from post-production and broadcast. Um, and we developed the software applications because there was, frankly, a gap in the market um, where I guess Apple had made Final Cut Pro such a dominant editing system, but 
people wanted to really complete the workflow from ingest, post-production, and play-out. So we have a, the suite of applications that we've developed over the years, and um, we run exclusively on Mac today. We work with Mac Minis, Mac Pros, we use AJA hardware, we use Blackmagic hardware, really kind of giving people a lot of flexibility. So typically for ingest, we're using maybe Mac Minis rack-mounted and the Sonnet X-Macs, um, but we can also use the new Mac Pros, of course, which are really, really powerful. So I guess as we move into sort of higher resolutions beyond HD, that's where things like the new Mac Pro are going to be really great for us. Um, so we've kind of we've, we've built these these applications, and, and now moving forward, we're adding more and more, uh, I guess, functionality where the core applications do 90% of what most people need. But what we find with the bigger, more complex projects is where somebody wants just a little bit extra um, in terms of functionality, and we've started to develop a. Um, I guess a next generation development platform which we call Encore um, and the first product that's come out of that is just Control and that at the moment is more about our playout systems so handling failover between our master playout and our uh, redundant playout systems but moving forward what we're going to do is take little core pieces of the different applications and make them plugins for the, the Encore system so that we can have a customer coming to us saying well I want some ingest but I want some playout and I've got some I need some metadata management for my production process, I need some transcoding, some files for approvals, and we can start building that kind of plug-in approach to, to building the technology out, while at the same time still using Apple hardware and, and third-party partner hardware. So we're very conscious of the fact that we're using commodity technology, really the best of the commodity technology that's available. Cool. I think you're one of the few um, manufacturers focusing on the Mac platform in that field, right? I mean, yeah. post-production has always been quite Windows heavy, uh, like a lot of the, the post-production software. So you, it's a rarity, right? Well, I guess, I mean, from my background, I mean, we've, you know, we've always been Apple post-production people, um, you know, all the way back into the very first non-linear editors on Mac back in the early 90s. Um, and the Mac has always been very popular in desktop post-production. You know, there's always been sort of high-end systems, your Flames and your Quantels and, and Avid have been there, and they've been on Mac and sometimes they've been on PC. Um, but I guess when, when Apple really came to market with Final Cut, they changed a lot of people's perceptions about what could be done with desktop editing. Um, and I guess we rode off the back of that um, and really sort of opened the market to not just your traditional broadcasters and your big post facilities, but actually where the market is now is that everybody wants to do media. Everyone wants yeah. to handle video. They want it online, on your iPad, um, as well as traditional you know, TV. So um, it's kind of a huge market there um, that really that's where we get so much interest. It's not just the traditional broadcasters and post companies who want to make their lives a bit easier, but you know, it can be anyone from web TV um, to you know, large banks to multinationals to uh, there's all sorts of you know, football stadiums, churches. All these people want to you know, handle digital media now. And of course, resolutions keep going up, frame rates keep going up. So how we handle those um, you know, 4K and ultra high definition um, Apple is still very, actually very focused on, with the new Mac Pro and, and Final Cut 10, you know, they're still focused on this market. may not be as obvious to a lot of people, but things like ProRes is still a very dominant format. And it's got, getting more dominant even, I think, with yeah. more cameras coming out Absolutely. that we called directly into ProRes. I, we just wish that you know, Apple would further develop ProRes because yeah. I think you know, not much has happened in the past few well, years. Well, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's interesting at NAB this, this you know, last week, there's been every major camera vendor is supporting ProRes, yeah. it's licensed I mean, it's, it. It's pretty essential, I think that's what you know, made the Alexa, one part of what yeah. made the Alexa so alluring because it's so easy to edit. Absolutely. And um, I think it's a good step by Sony to offer, you know, they will upgrade, yeah. offer an upgrade for the F55, F5 yeah. uh, to record directly into ProRes and then will make it much more feasible for production companies because but, I work yeah. a lot with with those cameras as well and you know, sometimes they require us to, the production co companies require us to record into a, a, a samurai blade from yeah. from Atomos, beca simply because uh, we can have directly into DNX HD for Avid or yeah. or ProRes, you know, and now that might not be necessary anymore. It Absolutely, makes, makes our lives uh, also uh, shoot as much easier if you just can, yeah. you know, record it directly into the camera. Well, that's, I mean, and, you know, I've had I've had quite a lot of debate in the last week with one of my colleagues about RAW versus ProRes ProRes workflow, and you're right. I mean, for me. Ari licensing Pro is, was the best thing they ever did. I think you know they really just went well. Here's a great codec. Raw is fantastic, but there's a lot of processing overhead involved in that. Huge data rates, 
do you really need that? Is, Pro, is ProRes good enough? And in a lot of cases, it's absolutely good enough, yeah. certainly for any kind of broadcast. It's simply great to edit. I mean, we all know we can now edit you know, every format with Final Cut 10 and Premiere, it doesn't matter. But yeah. still, performance-wise, a codec that is made for editing, like yeah. ProRes, is the best. Absolutely, a frame-based codec. Yeah. You know. um, yeah, I mean, ProRes, we haven't seen a huge amount of new development functionally, I guess, but it does support higher resolutions than HD and higher frame rates. And it wouldn't take much of a leap for them to be able to introduce very high frame rates which I guess is where we're all going with ultra high definition and 4K. It's going to go 100p, 120p, and probably higher for certain types of productions. Um, so, I mean, this is where new hardware like the Mac Pro is really going to help everybody. Final Cut 10 has been you know, rewritten to handle these high resolutions and frame rates. And yeah, I mean, ProRes has been very popular with all of our users historically, but we've also, for the show, we've added uh, support for MXF, uh, XD Cam, and ABC Intra. And those are those are GOT-based codecs, so they're a little bit harder to handle from a mathematics processing point of view, but there are a lot of people who do need to use those codecs still. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting to see all the cameras coming out. Everyone does a camera now. You know, AJA have got a great looking camera. Blackmagic have been doing cameras for a few years, and everyone's licensing ProRes. So, I mean, for me, the fundamental with ProRes as a format is at the end of the day, every file that goes into the iTunes store from a major broadcaster or a major feature company, it's a ProRes file. Yep. And you know, Apple are that gatekeeper. So for me, it's like if the high end has to submit into that format, if people can shoot with it, they can edit with it and deliver that, then it makes life a, a lot easier than it has been in the past. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there is to be a lot of hype around RAW. Yeah. And um, the funny thing is that a lot of inexpensive cameras are capable of shooting RAW now, and it is great. It's great to handle, I mean, it's great to work with RAW because you have so much possibilities. The problem is, in a real production environment, yeah. it is terrible to work with because yeah. it's just immense, you know, the amount of data is just crazy. And even, even very high-end productions uh, very often shoot on the LX in ProRes, yeah. like well, TV series. And exactly, TV series especially, but I think, from what I understand, Scorsese, when he did Hugo, he ended up just processing, oh, really? handling yeah. the ProRes and delivering that as a feature. I mean, same for Game of Thrones. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I heard that the, f the season they're shooting now is the first one they're going to shoot in RE RAW on the Alexa. Right. And so so for, I think the, the second uh, or third season was shot on ProRes. So, I mean, that means something, you know, yeah. if, 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 if series with on that level with a really big budget don't shoot in RAW. And the funny thing is now that the cheaper cameras have RAW, but they don't have ProRes. <laughs> like with uh, yeah. Sony, Sony just started with the, uh, when they brought out the F5, it, mm. it only does RAW, I mean with the appropriate recorder, um, but it doesn't do 4K uh, in the XAVC codec, which mm. is what you want to have because yeah, yeah. it's a really good codec. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the challenge with, you know, my, my experience with post-production and broadcast is in the world of acquisition, there are new cameras coming out every six to 12 months. So many cameras, new codecs, new formats, new flavors of RAW, new resolutions to deal with. And it's a real minefield because a lot of production people will rush out, buy the latest camera because it's, yeah, it's amazing, no doubt. And they'll go and shoot a bunch of material. And then they give it to the, their post-production department or facility and they'll be like, ah, uh, uh, you've just given me like five terabytes of RAW to process. Yeah. Um, which, you know, if certain productions, you could justify it. But for, for me, I think in a lot of cases, and I, this is what I've seen over the years, if, if, the, if the picture is good enough at a given quality, then you will handle it that way and you'll just post-produce it. It's great to have high-end raw, uncompressed or compressed raw, but at the end of the day, if it's an absolute nightmare to, to deal with, then it makes life a lot, a lot harder. I think, to be honest, that's kind of where Red have, have struggled, I guess, a bit more recently. You know, they kind of, I don't know if they invented RAW, but they were the real pioneers of At the least RAW they workflow. Have a, they are one of the few camera manufacturers that have a RAW codec which you can influence. You know, you don't have yeah. to record in one set, you know, yeah. uh, data rate. Yeah. So you can choose your compression, which is nice. So yeah. that kind of worked for them. But still, yeah, it is it is more difficult to deal with. Yeah, exactly. But we had a talk here all with Philip Bloom, Ryan Koo and Joe Marine from No Film School the other yeah. day here. And uh, we also talked about RAW and 4K. And I think it's the same with 4K for post-production houses. Mm -hmm. Most of them are not ready to do it yet. Absolutely. Even if you shoot in 4K, they downres it to 2K to master it, which is a bit of a waste. But you know, there are not many outlets where you can actually show 4K yet. So it's, it's this cat and mouse game where you know, who will be 
will be the next one to step up and just upgrade the Yeah, I mean, this system. is this is the issue. I mean, a lot of facilities have just put in three gig SDI infrastructure, which frankly can't cope with 4K properly or certainly no high frame rates. So, and there's no standard beyond three gig SDI at the moment as well. So a facility is looking to support 4K, well, what infrastructure do they it's put in? It's probably too early to invest for them. Yeah, it is. There's, yeah. there's, there's kind of nothing there. I mean, Blackmagic have been pushing sort of six gig SDI and now even 12 gig SDI is a this is the way you can handle it, but until it's standardized and ratified, you know, a lot of facilities are going to have to handle 4K in a kind of standalone workflow, which is going to be a challenge yeah. if there's a lot of material, if it's a big drama or a big feature. Do you guys have requests for 4K live editing? Well, I was, you know, before NAB, I said to the guys, well, are we going to show some 4K? And, you know, we had a lot of discussion about it. And, you know, We've tested 4K and we know we can do a certain amount of 4K based on the hardware that we use. At NAB, I've not had a single request for 4K. You know, I think it's, it's one of these things that we know it's coming, it is the next standard. But here and today, everyone's working with HD, you know, at least in the world yeah. of TV. And uh, you know, there's no doubt you know, when the market is ready, when the technology is ready. Do you think it, there will be, be like, I, I personally think that 4K will never be mainstream for TV because it doesn't make sense. The, we had another talk yesterday with Rodney Charges and, and Bruce Logan, two ASC members who yeah. are really experienced with, you know, they shoot high-end TV, high-end feature films. And, and, and they also agreed. I mean, you would need a, a TV like 85 inch and sit two meters from, away from me to actually be able to see the difference yeah. to an to a up-res full HD file. So yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, 4K, we'll see some adoption in things like sports high frame rate where you know there, there, is, there is some benefit in having the higher resolution and high frame rate stuff. Sky in the UK are building a 4K truck, you know, good for them. They're always first. You yeah. know, the BBC have been very standoffish about 4K and said, look, we're not going to be adopting this. Well, the pay TV channels need to set themselves yeah. apart. I mean, they Absolutely. need to have something. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at Netflix and what they're doing, you know, they're going to be pushing it hard because, again, they're, they like to be disruptive. But you're right. I mean, you know, I have to say, you know, 90% of the consumer market Are they going to really tell the difference, notice the difference? For us in the professional market, sure, you can see it. And yes, it's even more immersive. And if you're watching a football game on a 4K screen, yes, you can see the face of every person sitting in the back row in the, at the back of the stadium. Is that really the most important thing for most people? Probably not. So yeah, it's one of these things. It's not going away. It's certainly not like stereoscopic, which is kind of, for me, was always a bit of a, yeah. a fad. Um, It's going to come, it's going to take a little bit of time for it to be really relevant. I think um, what's interesting when you talk to people, it's always the most interesting thing about NAB for me is always the social part to yeah. meet people and talk about you know, what's happening. And uh, yeah. it's like two years ago when they tried, all the manufacturers tried to push 3D very hard. I think it was three years ago actually. And two years ago, they still tried, but you could feel that it was over. Yeah. Well, on the consumer side, you could still see like, them pushing out all the products they announced the year before, uh, trying to sell 3D TVs. And you know, a lot of people bought them because they, you didn't have an alternative, uh, but people ended up never using it. And you could feel it already at NAB when you talk to the professionals yeah. and other colleagues that you know, this is not going to happen. And, uh, but with, with 4K, I think it is happening, but there's a lot of skepticism and, and there's a, a big, you know, people think that um, they're just pushing it in order to sell more products, obviously, while a lot of TV channels especially are, are still not even in HD. Yeah. You know, well, we, in Europe, we have a lot of channels in 720p. Yeah. And in Austria, like public TV, 720p, they don't even uh, shoot everything in HD yet. I mean, this is, this is where the reality is. So Absolutely. I can't see 4K, 4K being adopted for TV in any time soon. Yeah, I mean, people forget how long it took for HD to get widespread adoption as well. I mean, the, you know, the Japanese were trialing HD back in the 80s in various flavors. Um, you know, it's really only in the last 10, 12 years that it's been more widely adopted. And as you say, a lot of people are still not even broadcasting it. The vast majority of channels are still not HD. So, yeah, mainstream TV is going to take a while. You know, large outdoor screens, live entertainment venues where you've got you know, 50 foot screens, you're going to need higher resolutions, you know, um, and I think there's a place for that. I mean, in, at least in the UK, a lot of the music festivals that we do in the summer, people are talking about shooting those in 4K, damn it to HD to do the offline edit, 
and ultimately I guess they'll do a 4K reconform for a, a long term master but everything will go out HD as I mean, far for, as TV. For, for post production it makes a lot of sense because you can also reframe which was something you could never do. Yeah. Photographers have been used to this forever. Yeah. You know, they can choose, I mean they, they frame while shooting but they can still optimize their composition and just crop into the image because of the high resolution. Mm. This was never possible for video. Yeah, I mean, 4K gives us this opportunity. It, you know, with the price that directors of photography lose a bit of the control because it's the editor who can, after all, probably, or the producer, director, who can change things in post-production, which were probably not intended uh, by the director of photography. Yeah, I mean, there was, there's notable examples of in history of, in film, people like Stanley Kubrick and uh, Francis Ford Coppola, you know, they sort of pioneered shooting very high, um, you know, large film stocks so that they could do pan and scan because they just wanted to be able to re-rack things. But it hasn't happened traditionally in the world of TV. So yeah, it's, it's another area. I mean, again, it goes back to the sports side of things where, um, you know, they're wanting to have uh, analysts in the studio wanting to look at specific techniques of the sports, sports players and they want to zoom right in on the action. Um, and people like AJA Video have, have got some great hardware that does 4K HD pan and zoom and down conversion, which they've been licensing to a lot of the big high-end post companies like Quantel and people and EVS. So certainly there is interest in that part of the market, you know, the, the baseball, the football, you know, in every different flavor of football. Um, we'll see some of that, but ultimately it'll be HD going out on air for a good long time and you know as you say we've we've only just got to the point where we can do some HD yeah well we, we talked about we talked before about the fact that you guys are Mac only and I was pleasantly yeah. surprised when I discovered that because I've been Mac only my entire life my yeah. uh, you know I was brought up by parents who have a graphic design agency they've been on the Mac in the 80s yeah when nobody when everybody was saying early 90s when I bought my first one was like uh, you know this company is going to be bankrupt within two years that's yeah. when I bought my first Mac right so uh, this was a good surprise do you think for, for your company is it the future to stay Mac only or is there discussion to well this is this is this is where I mentioned the encore technology that we've been working on it's actually a virtual environment so we can run it on any hardware we can sit it on top of any operation operating system. Um, so while we love Apple and Apple is in our heart, we have to accept that you know, they've become a totally different company than where we were even five or ten years ago. You know, they have a huge consumer business and, and while the media industry is still important to them and ProRes is critical to their long-term viability in this space, I guess, and the Mac Pro is a good reflection of their interest in it, at the same time we have to be a little bit more flexible around what Apple decide to do next. Um, so the Encore technology, at least, at least it allows us to give us the flexibility of putting it on, you know, it could be enterprise hardware, it could be Linux operating system that we can actually spin our software up on. So we'll have that flexibility. We'll always have Mac development, Mac support. Um, our UIs are designed for Mac. They're really, they're great to look at. They're really functional to use. So uh, we're never going to kind, kind of abandon Apple in that respect, but we have to be a little bit more flexible, I guess. Um, because you never know what Apple will do next. Yeah, I talked to some of your colleagues on the stand on your booth um, about you know production environments, and uh, they mentioned that you guys are thinking about going more into the production field and be more integrated with that. Yeah, I mean, I think our ingest products are actually our most popular. Um, you know, Justin and LiveCut um, both both really sort of have have been widely adopted across the world. So. I guess we're going to be taking that a little bit further and helping people to be more and more able to handle material on location in any location and, and deal with it flexibly in terms of post-production workflows. So yeah, there'll be some interesting developments moving forward around that. Great. Thanks for the talk. No and um, yeah, NAB is wrapping up. Are you staying around? or I've got a flight to catch this afternoon, so I'm going to be heading back cool. home. So to you, you're going to leave the packing up to other people? Yeah, that's that's definitely the case. That's I've the way done, to do it. done too many shows over the years, so it's definitely a case. Of, I get the engineers to do it. Good. <laughs> okay, nice talking to you. And cheers. Let's do this again. Okay, thanks. It was a lot. great. Uh, thanks for watching. Also, thanks to our other sponsors, B and H, who supplied all the hardware that we're using here. Zeiss, Vitek Videocom, and Tools on Air, of course. And see you on the next show of On the Couch. Thanks. <laughs>